oftentimes when people are presenting this idea to you and shoving this in your face, they're probably trying to do so in a way that markets whatever they're selling so they can make a bit of extra money. Instead of talking about problems, we're gonna talk about workouts today. We're actually gonna look at an older video of Natasha's where she speaks about her workout routine when she was a bit more resistance training focused, as obviously her focus has shifted a little bit. And we're actually gonna discuss something which is a really common question that no one seems to really give a good answer to, and that's gonna be regarding things like what is the best workout split? And I'm gonna tell you my opinion on that. I'm gonna tell you exactly why further on in the video. This is how I trained this week specifically. Every week is different, you know? Regarding like tra changing your training, it really does depend why you're training. If you're looking at like maximizing results, for most people, again, depending on goals, you kind of want to do the same thing for as long as possible and kind of get as good as you can at those movements. Especially when you look at like the realm of hypertrophy and maybe things like maybe like sports specific strength training where you look at like powerlifting, you want to get really good at the same kind of movements and progressively overload them. If you're training purely for enjoyment or perhaps a sport that may require you to be a bit more dynamic with how you're training, then yeah, sure you can can change bits and bobs when you want to. But for, for mo a lot of people I'd say is you're probably gonna get the best results doing the same thing and just getting better at what you're doing. But again, if enjoyment is a primary factor when considering your workout routine, then obviously you can just change things up if you want to. For workout one, dynamic, full body. I really focused on explosive movements and working on power. And then for workout number two, I did an upper body session. I primarily worked on my strength, some stabilization, and I always have to get some core work in there as well. And then for my third workout, it was my lower body day, which is slower than my dynamic day. And it featured Mario. So it's obviously gonna be my favorite day. And then my fourth workout was a second full body session. So regarding her split, she's obviously looking at full body, upper, lower, full body. So she's training everything roughly about three times per week, depending on how she actually splits her full body days. And this actually kind of answers the initial question in the video of what is the best workout split? Quite frankly, there isn't one. Whether your goals are hypertrophy, endurance training, strength training, whatever they may be, there is not one single best split. And quite frankly, I don't think one split is better than the other. When you look at hypertrophy, you've got like the bro split, like chest and triceps, back and biceps, you've got push pull legs, you've got upper lower, you've got full body. It doesn't actually matter. The best split for you is probably the one that aligns with your goals and the one that allows you to remain most consistent. Let's say you look at hypertrophy and we're looking at building muscle. So you want to accumulate a total of 10 sets per week for your chest, let's say. Whether you do that across one day, two days, three days, it really doesn't actually matter provided the weekly volume accumulated is equal. So you can do that all in a session or across two or three sessions if you want to. It really does depend. So again, there is no one best split. I program some clients a bro split, I program some clients full body days, I program some clients push pull legs. It really depends. They may have similar goals, but it doesn't mean their workout split needs to be the same. It can be different. Again, we don't look at necessarily like daily volume, but more weekly volume. We're actually gonna look at a couple of her actual workouts now. We're gonna look at the more hypertrophy focused workouts, which is gonna be the upper workout and the lower workout. We're gonna talk about a few of her movements, give my opinion, what they're working, how you can maybe do them better or slightly differently. I'm gonna go from there. So pull-ups, fantastic movement. Genuinely like vertical pulling, if I had to choose one pulling movement would probably be my preferred one. Because if you're doing a wide grip pull-up, actually it's here, if you're going through a full range of motion, you're actually gonna work not only the upper back, but the lats as well. So the first half of the movement's gonna be very upper back focused. The second half of the movement's gonna be very lat focused. So it does tick a lot of boxes. Again, pull-ups are very hard for a lot of people. So what you could do if you'd rather is maybe consider things like a pull down instead, like a pull down machine. The big thing here is to making sure you're going through sufficient range of motion. So again, people say get your eyes in line with the bar, maybe your chin over the bar. Again, when you're looking at building muscle, I'd say go through as much of a range of motion as you can we try and get fully over the bar but again that really is up to you and what you're trying to achieve so the bench press you see she's got her feet on the bench that's not how i would bench press personally i think ultimately when it comes to bench press i want to have my feet planted on the floor to keep stability there and also to allow me to get a little bit of leg drive which may help with the movement again is that going to be necessarily beneficial from a hypertrophy perspective probably not but when it comes to shifting more weight it's probably going to help and again having those feet planted is gonna kind of increase the stability as I do often find when my feet are on the bench. It limits my arch, which can alter my range of motion, which can also mean I'm probably not as stable and I may risk wobbling off the bench as that has in fact happened before. Then we go into a press up. Again, how you do press ups is very much up to you. I actually find doing press ups on my hand quite painful because it kind of puts my wrist in a bit of a funny position. I prefer doing them on my knuckles because it allows me to maintain a straight line between my wrist and my elbow so my forearm angle is much more consistent. But again, you may not like that. I do think the press up is a very underrated movement. For a lot of people, if you can't bench press 
purpose very effectively due to maybe being new to the gym or a strength deficit perhaps push-ups are going to be a fantastic shout because they do replicate the movement to some extent which you could use as like an earlier introduction to pressing before then progressively overloading to a bench press later down the line so dumbbell row you'll see the one thing she's doing here she's going really fast on the way up and then really slow on the way down so when you're looking at like hypertrophy what we really want to consider is the involuntary slowing of the contraction speed so the contraction speed is when she's gone from stretch so this position all the way up that's the contraction and the contraction speed will be the speed in which she completes that portion of the rep we want that to gradually get slower and slower as the rep gets harder and harder that's a good sign because then obviously with hypertrophy we look at training to failure if not close to failure and in doing so the contraction speed should certainly slow down so yes slowing down the contraction involuntarily is a big yes the way down the eccentric that stretching portion anywhere from two to four seconds is fine you do not need to worry about tempo work massively like i said it's not going to yield any additional benefit to hypertrophy two to four seconds on the way down is going to be plenty and then throwing in movements like this the paloff press are going to be really good if you are doing any kind of mixed grip deadlift for example because obviously when you're mixed gripping you're going to likely rotate slightly and throwing in anti-rotational movements will work the muscles that can help combat any rotation that may be occurring when you are performing those movements or just throughout daily life in general do you need to do them no i'm just saying they can be quite handy very quickly you know i've got to throw out there if you fancy tickly it, linked down below in the description and maybe even the comment section, you'll find the link to apply to work with myself, Ryder or Beth on a one-to-one -one coaching basis where we can help coach you towards your goals where you'll work with us individually and on a one-to-one -one basis. You've also got the link to the TFNL workout guides, which are workout resources with loads of information about fitness, nutrition, and also many months of programming within them for both at home and gym use. So if you fancy a workout to follow. And also you've got the link to the Train Heroic TFNL group coaching, which is a subscription-based service that costs less than your Netflix subscription and you can essentially pay to follow a program i create you can talk in the message board send footage and bits and bobs across in there i believe and also ask me whatever questions you may have as i often am in there pretty much every day so if any of those things tickle you then have a gander down below and tickle that description and obviously tricep dips great movement fantastic movement again how you do them is completely up to you what i would typically say is alter your body in a position that kind of allows you to do so pain-free some people get a bit of shoulder discomfort doing these movements you can see natasha is relatively upright here that's probably what's best for her but if that's a bit uncomfortable for you then you can lean forward slightly if you need to and then we go into the lower body so we're starting off with alternating reverse lunges five sets of 10 to 12 reps five sets is a lot of sets that is probably the number of sets i would do for my quads and glutes in one session just there alone in one movement if you're doing five sets of 12 so five sets of the same reps as natasha is doing realistically your intensity probably isn't high enough because again if you're training hard enough especially with the idea of hypertrophy in mind you do want to make sure that you're going close to failure if not to failure and then by doing so you should not be able to match the number of reps each set so doing five sets of 12 implies that there are definitely a few more reps left in the tank and the thing about this rdl is you can see her dumbbell is going quite far away from the body although it is kind of in line with the center line I do typically like to keep my dumbbell a bit closer to the, the legs. If you are hinging effectively at the hips and stopping the movement when the hamstrings and glutes are kind of done and the lower back's taking over, you kind of do want to keep that dumbbell closer to the body because it is going to allow you to hinge in a more effective manner. Whereas you notice when she does it, the hinge stops quite early on. So she's going back, hinge is done there. This extra range of motion is going to be very lower back dominant. So again, if you are really looking at just getting the hinge in focus, I think keeping the dumbbell a bit closer to your body may allow you to hinge a bit more effectively, thus keeping emphasis on the hamstrings and the glutes and take a bit of emphasis away from the lower back. Because most people watching this probably say they feel their RDLs very much in their lower back. Again, you're probably going through too much of a range of motion you're probably not hingy enough and the dumbbells are probably or the barbell are probably drifting too far away from your body thus allowing your lower back to take over more than you would like it to so try implementing those changes and you may find that it actually does help the hip thrust so natasha speaks about how she used to hip thrust very heavy but she essentially reduced the weight because she says she felt like the glutes were kind of getting pushed aside and she couldn't necessarily feel it or target the glutes as effectively firstly her range of motion is a bit excessive you do not need to go through that much of a range of motion we try and keep our shins as vertical as possible with maybe a bit of a dip but obviously the more the legs are traveling or the more the shins are traveling i should say the more other muscles are going to take over and the less the glutes are going to be working the other thing is my muscle connection and sensation do not necessarily correlate to effectiveness of movement so just because you may not feel the movement in your glutes does not mean the glutes are not working because categorically if the glutes weren't working you could not perform that movement so like doing a bicep curl it's like people say oh when i do a bicep curl i can't feel my biceps 
if, if your biceps weren't working, you could not bicep curl. It would just it would not work. So there must be something happening there to allow you to go through that range of motion. And oftentimes as we do get heavier, emphasis may shift away from feeling the movement to actually just working the movement and essentially trying to get the weight up, which isn't a bad thing. I'm not saying sacrifice technique or anything like that, but I'm saying don't let lack of sensation deter you from training hard or training heavy. But as a whole, I'm a fan of the workout. But again, Natasha and I train very differently. She's always been a bit more functional, a bit more about enjoyment. I've been a bit more hypertrophy and strength focused, a bit more about optimization, we'll say. And neither is right or wrong. It's simply just our preference. This is her preference, and I fully respect it, and actually very much aligned with much of what she's doing. And my preference is simply mine. Like I said, neither one of us is right or wrong. We're simply training in the manner that we believe is best for us as individuals. And you're allowed to do the same thing. Just because something may not be optimal, just because something may not be fun, perhaps, doesn't mean you shouldn't do it it's about doing what you want to do because it's your training your body and your goals and prioritizing yourself in this journey is probably the most important thing but a lot of trainers and influencers online will sell you workouts saying this is the best split for this or this is how i achieve my results because i did this split which is the best best kept secret the best secret split Categorically, no, there is no one best split. Oftentimes when people are presenting this idea to you and shoving this in your face, they're probably trying to do so in a way that markets whatever they're selling so they can make a bit of extra money. Training can be quite boring and it's actually quite <laughs> underwhelming when you say to someone, there is no best split. It's about doing what you can actually stay consistent with and what you actually enjoy. Especially when looking at hypertrophy, provided weekly volume is equal and recovery is okay, it doesn't really matter too much how you split it. But again, that's just my opinion. And I'd love to hear your opinion in the comment section below. But until the next one, thank you for tolerating me. Thank you for tolerating my underwhelming statement about the best split. And thank you for tolerating the video.